Hi, and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's book, the show comparison for The Expanse, Season 2, Episode 12, The Monster and the Rocket. This video is part of a series of videos where I compare The Expanse TV show to that of the novels, pointing out the differences and giving my opinion on how well I feel these adaptations work. So I have to start with a spoiler warning for The Expanse up to the end of Season 2. If you haven't seen up to this point, you may not want to watch this video, otherwise some things will be spoiled for you. However, I will not spoil future events from the novels to have yet to occur in the show, so if you watch the show but haven't read the novels yet, don't worry, this will be free from future spoilers. So this episode is perhaps the strongest departure from the novels that I have covered yet, as pretty much everything that happens in this is totally off the books, so it's going to make it a little hard to compare, but I'll do my best to talk about what happened in the books around uh, this time. So. Uh, the episode begins with a montage of Aaron Wright starting to feel the guilt and the pressure as his career is about to be destroyed because of the part that he played in the Eros incident and working with Jules Pierre Mal and how that's about to be exposed. We see him meeting with his son as he gives him precious advice as Aaron Wright clearly believes that this may be the last time he sees him before he's disgraced or perhaps even goes to prison. Now, in the novels, we never came anywhere, anywhere near as close to examining Aaron Wright's life. We never saw him talking to his son, nor was he in, ever in danger of being disgraced. That uh, didn't come until much later in the novels in the material that the show covered in Season 3, and all of that took place off-screen. As at, in this stage in the story, uh, that the, uh, he was still... Uh, fooling Eva Sorella, who wasn't even aware of his involvement yet. But this was a great scene uh, for this storyline that was established in the show, and it really helped flesh out Aaron Wright's character and help him to feel more real, so I'm going to give this a plus two. So next we go to Ganymede, where Alex and Holden are on the Rosnate, where they try to hunt down the protomolecule hybrid. Holden tells uh, Alex a story about how when the first European uh, sailing ships arrived in the Americas, the natives couldn't see them as they were so beyond anything that they could comprehend. Alex then says that perhaps the hybrids are the next step and the humans uh, will be the ones that become obsolete, but Holden replies, not if I can help it, showing his determination. Prax then tries to talk Holden out of it, saying that it could be his daughter out there, but Holden angrily rebuffs him, saying that he'd understand if he were on Eros. Uh, they then chase after the hybrid, uh, and now nothing like this happened in novels. Holden and Alex never hunted down a hybrid with the Rosnate, and Prax and Holden never had a heated exchange like this. What did happen is, as I outlined in my previous video, Holden, Naomi, Amos, Prax, and their newly acquired Pinkwater allies were attacked and taken prisoner by a UN strike team under Avasarello's orders, who is still at this stage not certain about Holden's involvement in this incident. So Holden and the others wake up hogtied while a medic works to heal the injured Pinkwater mercenary. Holden tries repeatedly to talk to the UN mercenaries or to the UN Marines, but they are constantly ignored. The Marines appear to be preparing to move them uh, when fighting breaks out in the orbit between Earth and Mars and all hell breaks loose. So the commanding officer and a few other Marines leave to secure their departure. But after they do so, Holden and Amos manage to overpower the few remaining Marines and they escape and make a run uh, for it on their own. Now, I have to say, I actually prefer the novel's version of events, as although Holden also let his anger and fear get the better of him in the novels, here they take it to an extreme that I didn't really care for, especially Holden snapping at Prax and not caring about missing children, so I'm going to give this a negative 2. We then cut back to Earth, where the Eros hearings are about to commence, and Aaron Wright realizes his career will be over soon. He gives Avasarella one of his medals to give to his son, and uh, tells her to speak well of him. Avasarella tries to reassure him uh, by telling him that he was instrumental in helping uh, deal with the aftermath, and maybe they won't be so harsh on him. Uh, she then tells him about how she was uh, contacted by Jules Pierre Mal, and that he wants to meet to negotiate. Aaron 
Aaron Wright urges her to do so, saying that uh, because he's working with the Martian, he holds all the cards, and that she needs to stop him, otherwise he will help the Martians destroy Earth. Now, as I mentioned before, nothing remotely close to this happened in the novels. However, here we see Alva Sorrell being naive by telling Aaron Wright about her meeting with Jules Pierre Mal, as uh, we will see by the end of the episode, was a huge mistake. In the novel, she also makes the mistake of trusting Aaron Wright because she's unaware of his involvement. She sees that Admiral Wynn has put together a fleet to attack Mars, uh, the Martian forces on Ganymede, and she uses her political influence to slowly pick apart that fleet and reassign or decommission most of the ships in that fleet until what Wynn has left is just a tiny amount of ships that's insignificant uh, to start a war. However, she told Aaron Wright all about this, not realizing that he was working with Admiral Wynn, and before she knew it, Wynn had reconstructed his fleet and was using it to wage war against Mars. That and uh, the betrayal of her assistant Soren is when she realized that Aaron Wright was the one working against her. I love both of these versions. I think they both work well for their respective stories, so I'm going to give this a zero. So next we see a group of frightened refugees wanting to leave Ganymede as the station is falling apart as they all approach Melissa wanting passage on the Synambulus. She assures them all that uh, they will get passage but when she sees Amos and Naomi she refuses them passage but Naomi says that she's there to fix her ship but Melissa assures her that someone is already working on it but Naomi convinces her no one is at, as good at repairing ships as she is and she boards the ship to find the person more working on it indeed doesn't know what he's doing so Naomi shoes him away and starts repairing the ship. Now again nothing remotely close to this happens in the novels. The novels never actually deal with the civilian population of Ganymede and what happens to them when the station starts falling apart. And Melissa was not in this part of the book. She was simply an aid uh, worker that we saw earlier. Naomi and Amos weren't involved in trying to rescue refugees and instead were with Holden and Prax as they tried to find a way off the station after being captured by the UN Marines. The Cenabulus, as I explained in previous videos, was the ship that the OPA provided to Holden to sneak on to Ganymede and once Holden and the others ex escaped from UN custody, Holden gave this name list to the Pinkwater mercenaries who took it so they could leave Ganymede, and they parted ways by saying that they hoped they never see Holden again. I actually like the show's version uh, a lot better because the novels touched never really touched on issues like uh, I mean they touched on issues like the Cascade and how Ganymede was falling apart, but they never dealt with those who left who were left behind, those who had to deal with these things. I think it strengthens uh, Naomi's character to show that she actually tried to do something about it. Uh, so I'm going to give this a plus three. So we then go back to Earth where Avicerala, Kotiar, and Draper prepare to leave on their mission to meet with Jules Pierre Mal. Kotiar stops Bobby before boarding the ship and demands to know if she can be trusted. And Draper responds by saying she never betrays anyone first. But if someone hurts her or her own, she'll go through them like a door. And that seems to satisfy Kotiar. So they board the ship and prepare to lift off. And Avicerala is clearly uncomfortable and not used to space travel travel and so she asks Kotiar to distract her but he starts talking about how he doesn't like the meeting with Mal and he doesn't trust him so Avicerella changes her mind and tells him to be quiet. Draper then asks why she's there and Avicerella explains that as long as she's on earth she's a bargaining chip for the Martian negotiations so she has taken her off the table and Draper retorts uh, that she's not a fragile flower but Avicerella says that's also why she's there to protect her in the case that anything goes wrong. So first off, I find it a tad ironic Kotar is accusing Draper of betraying Avicerella when this character is partially based off of Soren, who did in fact betray Avicerella in the books. In the novels, Avicerella is ordered by Aaron Wright to go to Ganymede on Jules Pierre Mal's ship shortly after she figured out Aaron Wright was in league with Mal 
in order to acquire the hybrid technology. This was done as a way to sanction her and to keep her isolated and controlled. She goes along with it because if she doesn't, she would lose her political power, which she'll need in order to take on Aaron Wright. This is shortly after she learns that her assistant Soren was working with Wynne and Aaron Wright. So she asks Bobby to come along because as she states, Bobby and her husband are the only two people in existence that she trusts right now. Bobby isn't a bargaining chip in the novels, has she uh, never defected, she simply went to work for the UN, and as a diplomatic tactic, uh, the Martians chose not to care. And I have to say, I kind of like the book's versions better, as it was a bit more dire as Avicerella was at her lowest point, all alone, not knowing who to trust, so I'm going to give this a negative one. So next we see Aaron Wright looking solemn and writing a letter. We then see him pick up a vial of something and stare at it uh, contemplatively. So in uh, the context of this episode, we're meant to believe that Aaron Wright is considering suicide and the letter he wrote was his uh, suicide note. But as we later learn, the vial he is holding is poison, but more specifically a poison designed to work specifically for Martians and make their deaths look like a heart attack and he would be immune to this poison. So he clearly isn't considering suicide. He had already made the decision to kill Korshinov instead of taking the fall himself and is psyching himself up to do it. As for the novels, as I said, we never got into a, as much detail with Aaron Wright, and he was never in a situation like this, but I like what it does for the show, so I'm going to give this a plus two. So then we go back to the Rosinate where the hybrid has entered an old structure. Alex is concerned about flying so close uh, into the structure, but Holden orders him to keep going. Uh, when the hybrid is in his sights, Holden fires at it but misses. Prax is outraged. He tells him to stop, but Holden yells back that that's not his kid, not anymore. And Prax states that the protomolecule isn't the issue, it's protogen and people like him. Holden then orders Alex to continue the pursuit, but Alex fights back, saying that they can't maneuver in there, and uh, that it's possible that the hybrid is leading them into a trap. Holden simply replies by asking Alex if he's refusing a direct order, to which he replies no. Now, as I mentioned, nothing like this in the books, and Holden never went quite this mental with revenge. He and Prax never yelled at each other like this, and they uh, always got along fine. After Holden and the others ex escaped uh, from the UN custody, they had to travel through the maze of uh, Ganymede Station in order to get back to the landing pad that Mal's men were using uh, in order to uh, meet up with Alex and the Rosinate. They relied on Prax to guide them through the station, including parts of the station that were damaged, so as some parts they had to get into suits and sort of float by. Uh, to me, that was a lot more interesting and believable for the characters than the scenes that we got here with Holden acting all crazy, so I'm going to give this a negative three. We then uh, see Melissa addressing the crowds of refugees wanting passage off the station, telling them that they uh, have to do it her way if they want passage off of Ganymede. Uh, they then start to freak out and charge towards the ship. Amos uh, fights them off along with a big muscle man, Champa, that Melissa hired to keep the people in order. When the, the chaos breaks out, Melissa and Amos flee back to the Cenabulus, leaving Champa out with the crowds. Melissa tells him that he, if he wants passage on the ship, he needs to calm the people down. Once on the ship, however, Melissa Melissa's mechanic tells her that they only have enough air for 52 people, and Melissa tells Naomi that there are over 100 people out there who are violent and freaking out, and uh, states that there's no way they're going to let them choose who lives and who dies, so the only thing to do is to just leave them all behind. But Naomi strongly insists that they aren't leaving those people behind. Now, as I stated, nothing remotely close to this happens in the novels, but I do like the predicament presented here. I think it adds a lot to the story, so I'm going to give this a plus two. 
So we then get a scene of Aaron Wright meeting with Korshanoff and informally, and, and has they share a bottle of scotch. Korshanoff begins by saying that there's no way a peace treaty can be signed until the UN returns Bobby Draper to them, but Aaron Wright then retorts by stating plainly what he knows about the protomolecule and that he knows that Korshanoff decided to work outside the confines of his government to make a deal with Jules Paramount for the protomolecule hybrid technology because he had done pretty much the same thing himself. Korshanoff doesn't try to deny this, and he acknowledges it by saying that Aaron Wright lost his chance, and now somebody has to lose. Now, as I mentioned, there was no character of Korshanoff in the books. In fact, we never saw who Aaron Wright was bidding against, and at this stage, the Martians didn't have control of the protomolecule uh, project. They were in a bidding war with Aaron Wright over it, uh, one that Aaron Wright won, but since we never saw from his perspective, we don't know uh, how that went down or how it happened. So it's fascinating getting to see a lot more detail, seeing Aaron Wright and Korshanoff, who both betrayed their government, uh, to side with Mal square off against one another. So I'm going to give this a plus three. So we then see Korshanov bragging and justifying his decision to buy the protomolecule until he uh, slowly starts to feel ill. He then collapsed to the ground, clutching his chest, and Aaron Wright explains that he poisoned his drink with an enzyme designed to attack soldiers taking medication for gravity sickness, and that it makes the death look like a heart attack. And as Korshanov dies, Aaron Wright gloats by saying that Korshanov was right, one of them has to lose. He then play acts as he calls for help, making Korshanov's death look like it was from natural causes. Now, this is a great scene, but as I said, completely off the books, there is no equivalent. In fact, show Aaron Wright is portrayed as much more insidious than book Aaron Wright, who by all accounts was just some stuffy politician. I love it, though, and thought that the scene was amazing, so I'm going to give this a plus four. So we then see Cotillard and Bobby Draper on the dropship as it prepares to dock with Jules Pierre Mouse's yacht. Uh, Cotillard tells her to consider herself an observer as he loads his gun, saying that he will be in charge of protecting Alvis Rella. Draper then asks if he served. He reveals that he was an intelligence agent and she insults him for having no morals and says that it makes sense that he ended up with a politician like Alvis Rella, but he said that he's with her because he allowed her son to be killed. So now let me finally get to Book Cotillard, as this is around the time he enters the story. As I touched on before, Cotillard in the books was a very different character, much more minor character who only appeared in the section that took place on Jules Pierre Mao's uh, yacht. He was simply a security agent assigned by the UN to protect Alvisorella. In fact, he had a whole team. He didn't have any personal ties with Avicerella, and he didn't have a banter-like relationship with her. That part of show Cotillard was more inspired by the book character of Soren. In the books, Cotillard and Draper got along fine and worked well together to try to ensure Avicerella's safety. Of course, I much prefer show Cotillard to book Cotillard, as he's a much more well-developed and interesting character. Book Cotillard was just a generic UN security man who popped up out of nowhere for this sequence and then promptly disappeared once the sequence was over so I'm gonna give this a plus two so then Avicerella, Draper, and Cotier enter Jules Pierre Mal's yacht and are greeted by the captain whose name is Malik. He's a, uh, it's a very luxurious ship and Malik offers them refreshments to which Draper jumps at, but Avicerella makes a joke about how she doesn't want to run out of Spartan conversation before his boss arrives, but Malik replies that that won't be an issue and then Jules Pierre Mal steps in and greets her with a lot of pleasantries, but Avicerella replies simply by saying, just get to the fucking point. Now, in the novels, this whole sequence went on for much longer, and the yacht uh, was described as much, much more luxurious, so much so that Draper was complete all in the wastefulness of everything. No doubt the show didn't have enough disposable budget to waste on making Mal's yacht look so extravagant, 
which is understandable. But as I mentioned in the novels, they weren't there to meet with uh, Mal to negotiate, but Mal was supposed to ferry them to Ganymede. Uh, the first night they were on board, they had dinner with Mal, in which Draper wasn't interested in the food at all, and Alvisarello was just making polite conversation, while Draper was the one who verbally attacked Mal, trying to cut through the bullshit and tell him that he's won, so why not give this up? But of course, he completely denies everything and is still playing a stupid game and Avicerella just played along. I think both scenes work for their respective mediums, so I'll give this a zero. So Jules Pierre Mal then arrives and he tries to negotiate with Avicerella to stop her financial tax on his family, saying that uh, if he sells the technology to both Mars and the UN, it will maintain balance through mutually assured destruction. Avicerella is skeptical and points out that he will silently benefit from both parties in such a deal. But then they are interrupted by a message from Aaron Wright. Uh, they play the message where Aaron Wright reveals that Korshnov died from a heart attack and at the same time, he gave the order to destroy the Martian ship that Korshinov had sent to take control of the protomolecule hybrids. He berates Avicerella, saying that he is more loyal to Earth than she ever was, and then tells Mal that he only had two friends that could protect him, and the other one is dead. So his only choice is to come back to work for him and to clean up his mess, which no doubt means kill Avicerella. So Mal gets up to leave, uh, and Kotiar and Drake immediately take up the Svensson's positions as Mal's men pull their guns and cover Mal's departure. So in the novels, nothing so grand happened. Uh, the shooting on Ganymede broke out earlier, presumably when Aaron Wright won the bidding war for the protomolecule hybrids, and he started the shooting war to cover it up and also to prepare to move against Mars now that uh, the UN had the clear advantage. After Avicerella had dinner with Mal, he simply left and returned to Earth, and Avicerella stayed on board with Draper and Cotillera as she continued to try to undermine Aaron Wright's efforts uh, politically, but was handicapped by the fact that all of her communications were being monitored. Now, I do really like both versions, uh, the book and the shows, but I have to say the version, this version, is definitively more suspenseful and packs more of a punch, so I'm going to give this a plus two. So then we go back to Ganymede where uh, the ship Aaron Wright uh, destroyed crashes down on Ganymede causing a panic with those trying to get on to the Synambulus. Uh, Melissa insists that they need to go now and just leave all the refugees behind but Naomi refuses and tries to leave the airlock to go to them. Amos stands in her way and refuses to let her go but Naomi sedates him and leaves anyway. As soon as she opens the outer airlock, all the refugees come storming in, and Champa attacks Naomi and accuses her of betraying them, but Naomi tries to explain to him that they only have enough air for 52 people, and if he helps her to keep the people in order uh, to choose 52 people to come on board, she'll give him her seat. Uh, when he asks why she'd be doing this, she explains that she was there on Eros and didn't do enough to save people. Champa says that he had a brother on Eros, and Naomi replies by saying, we all did. So Champa then starts attacking the rabble-rousers and gets the people to calm down and be orderly. He then gives a speech about how Belter's lives are hard and they are better than this, and he urges them to let 52 people on board, starting with small children. Melissa then then opens the inner airlock and Champa lines them up and calmly organizes them to board. However, many have to stay behind, some even parting with their loved ones. Naomi thanks him and then tells him to board himself, saying that he's earned it, but he gently pushes her inside the airlock, saying that her work is not done yet, and he and the others wish Naomi well as they depart. Now, as I said, nothing like this happened in the novels, but this scene is simply amazing as it expands on how regretful Naomi and the others were that they couldn't do more in Eros and her desire to do more now. And it was just an extremely powerful scene, seeing the refugees calmly organized in order to save some people's lives really goes above and beyond what the books did, so I'm going to give this a plus five. 
However, when this enabler takes off, it's targeted by uh, the Martian blockade and told to turn around or they'll be fired upon. Naomi refuses at the back down, stating that they are carrying refugees and cannot turn around. While Holden and Alex are on the, uh, their hybrid hunt, Alex notices that the Snambulus is in danger, but Holden orders him to stay until the hybrid is dead. But Alex urges him that their family is in trouble and needs their help. So Holden snaps out of it, and the Rosnate shows up just in time to shoot down a missile fired at the Snambulus. Uh, both Martian and UN fleets then target the Rosnate, to which Holden replies by targeting all of them back. He then sends a message out warning them that any ship that fires on them or the Sinambulus will feel the complete arsenal of the Rosnate rammed up its ass. They then back down as Holden explains that they're saving their bullets for each other. And the Rosnate leaves orbit uh, with the Sinambulus, but the Rosnate has an ominous terror on the side of the ship. Dun dun dun. Now, in the novels, Prax led Holden and the others across the surface of Ganymede where they found the Rosinate parked somewhere away from the domes. They then go to safety and board the Rosinate and leave Ganymede altogether. And uh, here's where I suspect the protomolecule hybrid broke into the ship and stowed away on the Rosinate while it was parked on the surface. The Rosinate then has to elude several attacks as the battle wages in orbit of Ganymede, but they barely make it out by the skin of their teeth. And as exciting as that was, I do much prefer the show's version as this was truly exciting and a great character triumph for Holden who snapped out of his revenge-fueled rage to save what really matters to him, his family. Plus the whole ultimatum that he gave both fleets was such an amazing badass moment. So I'm giving this a plus five. So my final adaptation score for the monster in the rocket is a plus 24. A pretty strong, solid episode in which I, as I said, was almost totally off books. And while I wasn't the biggest fan of the Holden movie Dick Quest storyline, I did think the uh, show improved upon the books in many other areas, uh, particularly focusing on uh, fleshing out Aaron Wright and Kotiar and making them more interesting characters, and also uh, having the uh, Ganymede situation focusing on saving refugees, which I think was a really nice touch and made for a powerful and touching ending. So that's it for my book to show comparison for season 2 episode 12. I'll be back in a few weeks to cover the season 2 finale episode 13. So be sure to keep an eye out for that. Also check out my channel as I cover many other videos on The Expanse as well as doing other shows like Star Trek, Lost, Game of Thrones, Discovery and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.